Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Mary Zimmerman's play Treasure Island, which is an adaptation of the Robert Louis Stevenson novel of the same name. Um, this is my first Mary Zimmerman play that I've read. I've seen uh, a production of her play Argonautica, but this coming April, yeah, I think early April, uh, I am going to the Comparative Drama Conference, and Zimmerman is going to be the keynote speaker. So, I'm going to be reading a number of her plays prior to that. Uh, and I started out with this one because I re I love Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, I really enjoy Treasure Island. This play is a pretty faithful adaptation, I would say, of the Stevenson novel. Um, plot more or less follows Stevenson's plot. Um, there's not any real major deviations. Of course, there's minor deviations because with a play, you have a much, you have a limited amount of time you can put things on stage, whereas with a novel, theoretically, you can describe things ad nauseum. Uh, and so some of the things that we get in the book are not in the play, but for the most part, the major points from the, the book are in the play itself. Um, Basically, the, the storyline of the book, um, the story follows Jim Hawkins, who's a young, um, maybe like 12, 13-year-old, something like that, in the early 1700s on the south coast of England. Um, when some pirates show up, well, one pirate shows up um, with a secret treasure map, and then a number of other pirates come to try and kill him and steal it. Jim ends up with the treasure map. He goes to Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey, who are the two sort of local bigwigs slash government officials slash learned people in the town, and they're like, we should sail for this treasure. So they do. Um, and they bring Jim along as cabin boy, um, they Squire Trelawney goes to Bristol, that great seafaring town, and he hires a ship called the Hispaniola. Um, he puts together a crew with the help of the person he hires as a cook, Long John Silver. Um, Long John Silver is a seafarer with one leg. That's significant because Jim had been warned by the guy who, ori who originally came to his mother's inn, uh, Billy Bones, who watch out for a seafaring man with one leg. And so Jim is initially quite concerned about this development. But Long John Silver is very charming. He's very affable. Um, he makes friends with everybody. With the sort of exception of Captain Smollett, who really doesn't make friends with anybody. Um, Smollett is very much a sort of rigid, I am a British uh, sea captain, things must be done properly type dude. So, with this crew largely found by Long John Silver, Captain Smollett in command, Squire Trelawney as the Admiral doing who knows what on the ship, other than just sort of causing chaos. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Livesey is ship's doctor, and Jim as cabin boy. They set sail for the island where Captain Flint has buried his treasure. Captain Flint, famous pirate, um, most feared pirate of all, according to the book and the play. Um, Near the island, Jim overhears Long John Silver and Israel Hands. I think they're some of the best character names in Treasure Island. I think Israel Hands is a great name. I think George Mary is a great name. Ben Gunn is a great name. Long John Silver, great name. Stevenson was amazing at naming people. Or amazing at naming pirates, at least. Um, so, anyway, Jim overhears... Long John Silver, Israel Hands, and another dude plotting against the captain. They they want to seize the treasure, seize the ship, etc., etc. 
Jim then goes to the captain, along with the squire and Dr. Livesey, and reports what he's heard. Um, the captain sends most of the crew off to the island as shore leave, and then they, those who are loyal, sort of gather up as much of the supplies as they can, take the last boat, and they flee to a fort on the island. They then defend the, that fort against um, an attack, Jim had gone with the pirates, and he ends up sort of splitting off to try and find the fort, find the treasure. Don't really know. But he does find Ben Gunn, who's been marooned on the island for three years. He's slightly nuts, loves cheese, so, you know, can't be all bad. Um, but Ben Gunn agrees to help them in exchange for them taking him off the island and giving him some cheese. Um... There's some fighting back and forth between the pirates and uh, the captain's party, we'll call them. Um, John Silver seems to be trying to play both sides against the middle and mainly building sort of an alliance with Jim Hawkins. Um, he saves Hawkins from being tortured to death by the other pirates. And in exchange, he asks that Jim and Dr. Livesey try and save him from being hung uh, if the, the pirate rebellion fails. Eventually, the captain's party abandons the fort, um, giving Long John Silver the treasure map, and they head out. Pirates take over the fort, then they decide they're going to go after the treasure. They get to where the treasure is supposed to be buried, and they find that it's gone. Because Ben Gunn has taken all the treasure to a different location. Um... Some of the pirates get killed, some of the pirates run off, um, but eventually Long John Silver um, is, is the only pirate left. He is captured. They're taking him off. Um, they've got all the gold. Everybody has their own share, etc., etc. They sail back uh, toward England. At some point, Ben Gunn lets Long John Silver go because he's convinced that Silver would have killed them all. Jim gets back to England, and everybody's, you know, I don't know, rich and happy. So, that's the basic plot line. Um, Zimmerman's play, again, follows it very, very closely. There are no real divergences. Um, there's some character names that I don't really remember from the novel, though in fairness it's been a few years since I read the novel. Um... There's no major plot points that differ. So, in adaptation studies, we have this concept called fidelity. Um, and, and fidelity criticism. There's actually a, a long tradition that goes back even sort of before adaptation studies was formalized into a critical theory or critical discipline. This idea of critiquing fidelity discourse that... An adaptation should align precisely or as precisely as possible with the original source. This, of course, doesn't work with something like adapting a play into a new play, but it does work with something like adapting a novel into a play. And so Zimmerman, as an adapter, has a high degree of fidelity to the original source material. Um, and this isn't bad inherently. This isn't this isn't a bad thing. It's not a criticism of Zimmerman. Um, but there are sort of limitations to that in terms of producing a new work of art saying something new. What Zimmerman has done here, and she's done it really, really well, is transmedial adaptation, which means adapting from one medium to another, in this case, from the novel to the stage. Um, and that inherently requires differences, but it doesn't inherently require differences in the storyline. So where, where most of the re-envisioning of this adaptation is really vested is in the performance structures. And Zimmerman talks about how they performed in the original 
thing with a sort of two-tiered stage um, in which the main stage mostly functioned as the ship, um, but then the two levels played different roles at different times. And one of the things that I like about this publish, uh, publishing by the um, Northwestern University Press is that they actually include production photos at the end. So you don't get a full sense of what the stage looked like. But in this one, for instance, um, this is Mrs. Hawkins and Jim Hawkins when he is departing for sea. She gives him a, a sea jacket. And so you can see the, the stage setup they're on very clearly looks like the ship, even though at this point that's meant to be the Admiral Benbow Inn. Um, and then you can see over here in this production photo, for instance, this is um, Dr. Livesey, Squire Trelawney, Captain Smollett, Redruth, who's uh, Squire Trelawney's servant, and Aunt Abram Gray, who's one of the uh, one of the only loyal crew members, they're on board the Jolly, but um, not a lifeboat necessarily, but it's a it's a shorter boat, a smaller boat attached to a ship so that you can go ashore and things like that. And so you can see um, in, in the sort of foreground of this picture is still the stage, the ship itself, but then the jolly boat is sort of built onto that. And so that's one of the things that we get here is like, oh, here's one where you can actually see kind of the whole stage. Um, and so these two tiers function as different spaces within the storyline um, and allow the, the production to... Um, to do everything that it needed to do, to create all of the spaces it needed to create with the imagination of the audience. One of the other things that Zimmerman does, and based on having seen Argonautica, um, I think this is somewhat standard for her, um, she adds in a lot of songs. So this is very near the beginning um, Mrs. Hawkins sings this song called All Day, um, just about Billy Bones, just drinking, watching the ocean, generally disrupting her and Jim's life at the Admiral Benbow Inn, etc., etc. Um, there's a number of other songs throughout, and then there's a couple of sea shanties, like actual traditional sea shanties, and at the end, again in this uh, Northwestern University Press printing, they include the lyrics and sheet music for the songs. Um, so all day, Leave Her Johnny is a traditional sea shanty, Roll the Old Chariot is a traditional sea shanty, and then the Coracle song is another one that um, that Zimmerman wrote for this. And of course, as a novel, the original Robert Louis Stevenson book is not musical. Um, there are instances in the book in which people sing, for instance, Dead Man's Chest, right? Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum, um, etc., etc. There are instances where people sing that, but it's clearly not a musical. Like, you're not, you aren't experiencing that. Whereas within the play, that's an additional medium that audiences get to experience. Uh, personally, I'm not a big musicals person for the most part. It's not really my genre. Um, but for the most part, this is a straight play with some songs incorporated rather than a musical as such, where a massive portion of the uh, of the action is done through song. 